pumps and valving. So there are going to be two typical types of pumps, AC and DC type pumps. We're going to focus our attention on the AC, alternating current based pumps, and we're going to look at that system and then we're going to look at valving. We're going to break out later into very specific labs and activities on calculation of sizing, head pressures, and a variety of other flows and so forth. But for right now, when we attach this pump, what we want to do is go with a known brand. There are a few major players that are out in the solar thermal industries today. And due to the constraints of the video, we can't really name any. But I do want you to know that there are some very good companies out there. This type of system that we're looking at here, this system is a built system that has all the components but it's not in a single package. It allows the installer a place to put the components closer to other places whereas the single system has the advantage that it's all together in one nice clean package but the downside is it's much more difficult to replace components in that single package as it were if you had it all in individual. So they've showed you right here that these valves, the hot and the cold, kind of telling you that this is the inlet, this is the return. You always put your pump on the going to the collector side. The hot water that has been collected from the collector should be as few of components in that side as possible. What we're going to deal with then is we use usually want to isolate always want to isolate that pump. So if the pump goes bad, I could turn off two valves, replace the pump, put it back in, and then just refill that small section as opposed to have to take the whole system offline, reinstall the fluid, and do a whole bunch of other tests and checks to make sure we didn't get air into the system. It's just a much safer process to do. And unfortunately, pumps are one of those things that will eventually go bad. That's just the way life is. So we always want isolation valves, and we always want drain valves. Typically, we want to use drain valves, it's not a big deal for drain valve situations to use just a regular globe valve or a gate valve in this case. Now, most times when we do isolations or valving, it's just better practice and it's a more efficient system to use ball valves. And the reason for it is, A, you have less restrictions, so there's less PSI pressure drops due to the insertion of these valves. And the other thing is, you know exactly if it's on or off by the swing of that valve. We will get into the scalding valve later, but these are the big components. So what do we want to highlight at the very end of this? We always put the pump on the non-hot side, so the fluid that's going out to the collector. The tank coming back in should have as few of components as possible. We always want drains and some sort of filling mechanism. I'll show that in greater detail in the next part. And then we want to make sure that we have isolation. At the next part, if I look at, say, our system that we're going to install by the Stiebel Eltron system, you'll notice that all the components that were shown on the previous image are all integrated into a single package, which makes it nice. It's actually a touch cheaper in some instances because it's all been integrated into a single package, but that cost comes back later to us when we have to replace something. I can shut this drain valve, and then there's another valve up here, ball valve a check. I can then undo these two fittings here, replace this pump, put a new one in if I need to. So there's a lot of mechanism in here that gives me flexibility that I may not have had in the other application, but here's the downside. Because it's a single package, if I need to get something, I'll have to buy it specifically from the vendor. Again, not a big deal. It's just an issue that we want to verify and know what's going on with. Now this system has been sized for a particular application, which typically is a process process, meaning you know what you want, you know how many people are in your house, you know how much domestic hot water is being used. This is going to be the system with the two to three collectors on the roof, for example, and we're good to go. There's not a whole lot of room for expansion. There could be. It all depends on a variety of mechanisms, but typically this is a one and done application. So you usually buy a nice kit that has the collectors, that has the controller, and it has this pump assembly. We will call this collective system the balance of system. So if you hear a balance of system, it implies a check valve, pump, flow meter, and then gates that turn on and off, pressure and temperature gauge, and then a hose that will go to an expansion tank. Anytime you have a mechanical pump, you will always need a check valve to prohibit thermal siphoning in the colder months and particularly in cold evenings. So we want that fluid to flow in one direction. Basically the fluid's coming from the tank up, pump, 
and out. And at night, when that cold fluid's coming back into, trying to chase that hot water, as it were, so it wants to check that shut. There are going to be different types of check valves. This is going to be a spring-operated check valve and not a, a spring-type check valve. It's not a bad check valve. It just requires a little bit more PSI to overcome that spring tension to let fluid flow. So there's a little bit of a loss there. Again, not much, but it's just something to be on the lookout for. Also, as we know, there always has to be a safety relief valve. And so this is a pressure relief valve, and it will automatically sit. And typically, that's somewhere near the 30 PSI range. And, and again, we will read the cut sheets and verify that by going up. So here's the manual. So if I go up top and look at the specifics, here's the specifications. So safety connections, they're going to tell me that I have 3 quarter inch piping. And if I go to the safety valve, it's actually at 87. The safety valve is at 87 PSI. So I said it was 30. I lied. And that's why we check. So that's why we now know it's at 80 PSI, which makes sense because we're dealing with the domestic hot water system and we're typically in that 30 to 40 PSI range. Some folks like to go higher. That's not a big deal, but we now know that that pressurized glycol system that this system is going to be running in is typically at the 80 PSI max, and that's ballpark for what we want. So that's what we have. You can see that the maximum permissible temperature is 248. At peaks, we can go to 356, so it's well robust for the system at hand and uh, we now know that this is a little bit older of a pump system they've got a new generation of system out so we're looking at a slightly different one as far as applications and variability we have the Sol 20 kit and it can handle up to 16 panels so yeah we can go up more but the thing of it is generally it's a package deal so you you want to just know what you're getting when you're doing all of this so that's what we have going on there